Today on Locked On Red Wings, Detroit battled hard, but they fell in overtime, an overtime period they probably shouldn't have gotten to in the first place, to the Los Angeles Kings falling 5-4. to four. David Perron has been worth the price of admission. Dylan Larkin saved the game, but the defense continues to struggle in its own end. Locked on Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for WWJ News Radio 950, while Scotty is the host over at Lockdown Tigers as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And the Red Wings have been handed their first loss of the season, falling uh, five to four in overtime to the Los Angeles Kings. And it's absolutely a mixed bag, uh, this game. I, I have a lot of things I love from this game and a lot of things that are concerning from this game. And I, that's a I mean, point. It, That's it what was I a take point out of this game. That's a point, baby. A point they probably shouldn't have gotten, but Correct. at the same time, they had a sh- crap ton of opportunities to. Wow, that was a great save. That's the best save, save I saw all night. That was better than any <laughs> save we saw in the Wings game. Golly, they had also had a crap ton of opportunities to bury the puck themselves that they didn't capitalize on. So, I mean, we're going to get to all that. There's so much to break down, but I, I think first and foremost, we have to talk about the fact that Tyler Bertuzzi, um, out for four to six weeks with an upper body injury. I love that, by the way. Uh, come upper yeah, body we, injury. We don't want to be too specific off rip, yeah. We saw the play. It happened. He took a puck off his hand. He has been seen around the rink with a cast on his arm. We know what happened. Upper body injury is so vague for no reason. But that's not the point. Tyler Bertuzzi out four to six uh, weeks. Uh, Jacob Verona did not play in this game because of personal reasons. We won't speculate why. All I can hope is that with three days off, before their next game against the Blackhawks on Friday, that that's enough time for him to mentally yeah, be prepared okay. for the next game. But if not, hey, we did the same thing with Dylan Larkin last year. It's just gave him as much time as possible yep. to get ready. But Tyler Bertuzzi, that's a huge blow to this team, oh, Scotty. And, and like, so the biggest thing I, I think off rip is just the fact that, you know, we talk about the contract extension all the time. We talk about, you know, he wants to get paid and he wants to get extended relatively long term. And, one of the biggest rebuttals every single time people want to bring up the Bertuzzi extension is the style of play, like how the longevity with his style of play. And um, this is just kind of a, not exactly. You yeah. Know, I wouldn't that, call that a not that black and white. I'm not trying to make it sound like, Oh, like he's, you know, like a, like a grinder. And so like, this is just going to happen all the time. I, I don't subscribe to that logic, but I mean, this is just that that's, kind of throwing himself and <laughs> putting his body on the line is just kind of how he plays hockey and it's going to happen sometimes. So really, uh, really unfortunate for him. I feel bad for the dude. Uh, but hopefully four to six weeks is a true timeline and we don't get the nonsense from 2020 where we were told like four to six weeks and then it extended to like eight months and we were like, okay, I guess he's just never coming back. This is an arm yeah. thing. So I'm assuming that it's that that's going to be a little more true to the four to six week timetable. And uh, hopefully he's just back and, and doesn't really miss a step with that. Um, but yeah, definitely really unfortunate. And this is, you know, we'll talk about it, but this is Zadina's time now. Like, I mean, he's going to the next four to six weeks, there's your showcase brother. Like there's your opportunity to, to prove that uh, you, you deserve more playing time when Burt comes back. No, I mean, I, I, it just, it, it sucks on twofold. I mean, one, he is such a vital player to that top six and it really sucks because it's a contract year for him. So he needs to play well for his own benefit and the wings could really benefit from a guy with high motivation in a season where they're trying to take a huge step forward. They yeah. continue to compete. So, I mean, it just sucks on multiple fronts. It's just but- a, yeah. I like it. You're two and oh, you're, you're excited. You know, you're having a good time. Like the spirits are high and then you just kind of get a gut punch of like reality check there where it's just like hey one of your best forwards is out four to six yeah it it just back before the new year though still going to be around for a lot of the season Uh, you know i I mean four to six puts it at what thanksgiving to early december somewhere in that range i mean in theory that's not that's not a not a terrible thing 
No, it's not. I'm, I'm looking forward to him coming back too. But when it comes to, so this gives an opportunity, as you said, to Phillips Zadina. And we saw it in this game. A lot of people bagging on him in this game. I thought he looked fine, if I'm being completely honest. Um, and he made really good plays in the defensive zone. I thought out of everyone in the defensive zone, he looked really strong. He was battling really hard down low, and he's really improved his 200-foot game. In the offensive zone, he made quite a few good passes to set up his teammates. When the puck was on his own stick, when he was under pressure, he coughed it up. And that's been a problem all year, all year long last season as well. So when it comes to this game overall, though, Scotty, there was a, a lot of was. pros and cons. It, what a game it was. Absolutely. <laughs> Man, it's just great. it was a crazy game from start to finish. The Red Wings came out. They scored pretty early on off an Adam Ernie absolute ripper. I've never seen Adam Ernie shoot a puck like that before. I think it went off. It might have gone off both posts. I definitely heard it hit iron once. And then L.A. comes back down the ice and responds immediately. immediately. And that sense, I mean, that was the trend in this game was yeah, just was we scored in bunches. They respond. And if yeah. it weren't for the fact they were they got a second goal in that first period to take a 2-1 lead, I mean, the Red Wings would have had the edge that entire game with the way that trend was going. But, I mean, the biggest, the biggest pro and the biggest con in this game has got to be the offensive offense and the defense, respectively. I mean, the offense, when it got in the offensive zone and set up, created a plethora of chances to score when and just could not up, capitalize. Yeah. What? I said when they were able to set up, yeah. Like, yeah, the, when the they were able to set up. Stellar, but... Also, getting set up was like a, an issue for some reason. Like, there was a, a, a huge thing that, I mean, they had a ton of, especially in the first period and a half. I mean, it was neutral zone turnover after neutral zone turnover. And, they, they, I mean, own zone, I almost just <laughs> dropped an F-bomb. That was crazy. <laughs> nice, um, save. Own, nice save. Own zone. Own zone turnover. Like, they had, uh, I mean, it, it was Again, for the first half of the game, I'd say it, it was constant turnovers in their own zone in the neutral zone. But when they were able to overcome that and actually get into the offensive zone, they're then creative. Right. Then it was, it, and it was not only opportunities; it was creative opportunities. There was really sharp passing. There was getting into areas that we're not used to seeing. Uh, th there wasn't very many offensive zone turnovers. Like it was, it, it was, it was a really. It was nice to see and something uh, – I thought it was a really well-oiled product that we haven't seen in the offensive zone in a really long time. But, I, I mean, golly, getting there was a huge problem for, for a large majority of the game. And then they got a little dump in Chasey at one point. I, like, it, it was – I saw that. You I... know, pros and cons, just like, just like you said. Well, like, so then you go back into your own end and at, at five on five at least. Penalty kill – and we'll get into special teams too because special teams – Looked good. I just across the board. They only scored one power play goal to finally get their first. But even when they did not score, I think for the most part the power play looked pretty solid. But across yeah. the board, special teams looked pretty good in my opinion. Um, but at five on five, they looked absolutely lost in their own end. I kept tweeting it out because I kept noticing it, and that's how they kept. I mean, that's how they got their fourth goal in the third period. They scored another goal like that, and they had a plethora of other chances as well. They continued to allow weak side high danger opportunities yeah. in their own zone at five on five. When a guy was carrying the puck along the wing, all eyes were on the puck carrier. And as, especially as a defenseman, but especially as a center as well, whose job is kind of serve as that third defenseman playing high in the slot, trying to cover that guy, extra guy, you have to keep an eye out for that guy breaking late down the opposite wing. Cause that weak side is what's going to kill you. And that's it killed the Detroit Red Wings in this game. It benefited them, too, because that's how David Perron scored one of his goals. That's how the Red Wings got a lot of their opportunities, a lot of which they didn't capitalize on. But they have got to be able to watch that weak side. That's especially where they struggled on it. Not to mention, just defensively overall, getting burned on the outside. They were flat-footed in the defensive zone. Our defensemen, the Detroit Red Wings defensemen, looked especially slow. And I hate to call them out, but Phil Pronick, again, yeah. it was a problem all last season. But he continually, his gap control, man, it's just not any good. He keeps getting burned on the outside. And if it weren't for Olimata, his partner playing phenomenal that in this game, this that pair would have been just abysmal. Yeah, I, I, I kind of get to the ad because I want to talk. I want to highlight Mata specifically. I thought he looked absolutely fantastic. We're going to talk to you guys today about Bilt Bar. 
And we're going to talk to you guys about cookie dough, chocolate, uh, the chunk puffs, man, because they're because they're phenomenal. They're the best ones. Like yeah. they're all really good. But the ch- cookie dough chunk puff built bar is by far the best one. And we've said it a million times and we will say it again. It is literally a protein bar with cookie dough chunks in it covered in 100% real chocolate. And it's only, I believe, 160 calories with 15 grams of protein, which is just, it, it kind of feels like a cheat code. Because, and I've I've tried, you know, I'm not as I'm not as into the gym as I was, but I had lost quite a bit of weight. I was going hard in the gym. I was eating protein bars. I was struggling to find the protein bar that just tasted the best. Because unfortunately, for some reason, eating healthy means that things taste like crap. And then <laughs> Built Bar came into my life. I Said, became hold on. It said, hold on. And they they started giving us some samples to try so we could give you guys 100% honest reads. And the Built Bars are by far the best protein bars I've ever had, better than any brand that I've tried. They taste good, and they're good for you. So when we read you these ad reads, and this one's completely – like, guys, this one's off the cuff. I'm off the cuff right now. But when we read you these ad, ad reads, they're honest. Like, these are not fictionalized – talking points when we do read them they're completely true i have not been disappointed by a flavor yet i have some that i like more than others but there's not been one that i have disliked and cookie dough chunk puff is the top of that hierarchy yeah i i inhaled the last box i got i like i i can i wish i had it near me i just have like an empty box that's like this big that used to be full of built bars that is no longer let me put it to you this way there's a joke in this ad read right here to my left that um it's like you buy it, you, you can, and maybe you hide it. It says uh, right here, or you can find a really good hiding place and just hoard it for yourself. That yeah. one struck a chord the first time I read that because when we first got the built bar trunk puffs, I told my roommates like, "Hey guys, we got these. Have at them. Let me know what you think. I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna share them." They were gone immediately, and I'm like, "Maybe I should be hiding these because I liked them a lot too." Yeah. I'm like, "Now I kind of want I more," but I mean, it says a lot when you know both my roommates at the time. Neither of them were really big into physical fitness and like they weren't eating the protein bars for like that post-workout trying to keep that pump, you know, trying to gain those muscles. They're just eating them because they tasted good. I mean, that says a lot about the flavor. So make sure you guys go to built.com. Use promo code locked 15, get 15% off your order. Use promo code locked 15 for 15% off at built.com. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Red Wings fell five to four in overtime to the Los Angeles Kings. It was a mixed bag. We're talking about it. Philip Peronik, we wanted to talk about that. Or did you want to talk about Olimata? We can just talk about the pair Let's as a whole pair. if we want. I mean, that's like the easiest way to do it, right? I, I, I really just wanted to highlight Mata because I thought he looked phenomenal. Right. I, I th- like there was there, there's an argument that he was like the second best defender uh, on the ice for the Detroit Red Wings in this game. And I don't. I don't think that that's like super. I, I honestly, it's not a hot not take, far, right? Not even far fetched. I think that's just like objective. He was everywhere, and like maybe part of that is because he the the dude that he's on a pair with was uh, looked a little slow skating and, and wasn't everywhere. But Mata was all over the place. He he somehow found a way to be in every like corner, like at the same time. I've never seen anything like it. It was ridiculous. He looks really good, and he looks good offensively too. What he had two assists, one assist in this game. Two assists, yeah, two assists. Like he, he, he was everywhere. He was really effective. You know, we talked about he had a lot of really good that, pinches. That that pair was going to be like, oh, Mana's going to be the defensive anchor, and Heronic's going to be more of the the offensive guy. And in this one, only Mana just said like, I'll just do everything by myself and just be great. And that's what he did. And on the flip side, you have you have Philip Heronic, who, uh, yeah, I, I mean. Look, the play at the end of the game, like, of I don't know, like, kind of just when it rains, it pours. Like, of course, it was yeah. off of Heronic. Like, I, I, I kind of feel bad if they do in that sense. But, um, but no, I mean, I mean, he got burned a lot. And when you talked in the first segment about like getting burned on the outside and just getting like outskated, that, that's a problem. Like that, it had the reason that that happened over and over again is because they kept doing it to Philip Heronic. Like that is literally why that comment was made because. It was it was eighty percent of the time it was off him. So like that's a that's something to keep an eye on. That's something that they're gonna have to mess with uh, for sure, and, and and try and find a way around it because we're I, I mean teams are gonna find out. And we're just gonna get burned on the outside the whole entire season if if that's not something that's that's fixable. So yeah, I mean I think I thought half of the def- defense looked okay. 
I think Ole Mata obviously was the best one out there. He was making a lot of really good offensive pinches, which is not something you brought him in to do, but he's just looked really great in this game. He was having a ball. I mean, he's got three points in three games now. He's got a goal and two assists. Actually, maybe more than that now. Um, a goal and three assists. So he's over a point per game on the season so far. Again, early second pairing defenseman (laughs) and a guy who historically does not have a lot of points. Right. I mean, he's already matched his goal total this season that he did with the LA Kings. I think uh, when he played with them last. So he's, he's been a bit of a surprise so far early in the season. I don't expect him to keep this pace, but he's been good for the Detroit Red Wings. But I agree with you. I think Philip Peronik is still showing the issues that he had last season. And if it were not for Oli Mata, uh, they'd get capitalized on more. Like, I do agree with you as well, though. I won't necessarily hold the game-winning goal against Philip Peronik because he was trying to make the right play there. There was, He was cr- trying to take the passing lane away and block the pass, and it just yeah, went off his leg into the again, net. Again, the comment you made earlier, too. Like, that, that was something that... Uh, kind of like replicated, but just, you know, with less skaters on the ice. Like that's just, they, they had the, the, uh, the lane that is formed on the opposite side of the ice as the puck was just open for business, yes. like toll free all night. And it just the, right. There was no resistance at all. It was, it was Swiss cheese. So like, yeah, like that's, that's, you, you know, he was trying to play for the pass and just whatever, kind of an unlucky thing. I, I don't, I don't think that specific play is the reason to say that he had a rough night, but like he, I, I think he did have a rough one. Um, also defensively, I, I, I want to know when it's like, okay to admit out loud that like Ben Sherratt's looked good this season. Um, I know that that was a super controversial contract and kind of one of the only Iserman moves so far in his entire regime that, uh, people have looked around and kind of been head scratching at, at the contract. And look, we got a long way to go before, it, you know, he got signed for what, four years. Like we, we got a long way to go before we look back and go like, Hey, Steve was right. Like this was a good deal. But, um, three games into year one, I, I think he's looked pretty solid. Uh, yeah, like he's, he's going to, as in our, in our crossover with locked on Habs, as, um, as they said, like, He's going to give it. He's going to take it away. Like sometimes those that like he drew the penalty in this game. Sometimes he's going to get called for that. This time he wasn't. He got the penalty drawn like great. Um, But I I thought he looked pretty good offensively in this one. I I thought that uh, he wreaks havoc in front of the net, which like we knew was going to happen. And and so he I think he's done that really effectively. I think he prevented a couple of goals in this game by by doing that off rebounds and such. Like, yeah, I I, I've been. uh, I've been pretty impressed with Ben Sherratt three, you know, again, three games in, but like, I, I've been pretty impressed with him so far. I, I completely agree with you. Um, and everything that you said, I, I just, the thing that Laura and Scott said, and you just said it there, the whole Ben Sherratt giveth and Ben Sherratt take it away. I can yeah. totally see being true today right. was a giveth game. Uh, he was Correct. drawing penalties with his, a little, his, his edge, that thing that you hate when you're playing against him, where he takes like a little bit of cheap shots, although he completely whiffed on his cheap shot in this game he did. and drew a penalty because of it, which was hilarious. He did whiff, um, like big time whiff. He yeah. also saved two goals on penalty kills on back to back plays yeah. or back to back. We're going to talk about special teams too, yeah. man. We got a lot to go over. There, there's, and we still got to talk about Larkin and Perron. I mean, it would not yeah. have gone to overtime if it were not for those two players, just like just to put it bluntly. Um, but. Sherratt swept the puck away from the crease on one where he was embattled with another player on a wide open net. He swept it away. Uh, and then on another one, that puck was floating in the air, but air behind Huso's head. And he just swatted it out of the air on back-to-back penalty kills. But then on, and I don't really hold this against him a whole lot, but in that goal that gave the Kings at the late lead in the third period, that one that squeaked behind who was just sitting there. Shrott was just yeah. standing there. Didn't know where it was at, but granted no one knew where no it was one at. on the ice knew where it was. At. So it's not just that that's not a situation where it's just one guy's fault for sure. Um, so yeah, it, he, he looked, he's looked pretty good through three games. And so it's definitely a player I'm going to keep an eye on. I thought more cider looked fine in this yep. game. I mean, he's just a rock, you know, he, he's, well, I mean, he had a heck of a play at the end, right. That kind of, he got tied up a little bit. And if it wasn't for him coming out of that little tie up with the puck, I mean, we don't, we don't tie the game there at the end uh, of regulation. So another clutch play by him as we've become accustomed to already. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And so we have to go to a, we're going to go to another quick break here. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the two biggest pros in this game. Um, Actually, three biggest pros, special teams, David Perron 
and of course Ryan the captain Fisher. Dylan Larkin. Oh. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. But so we're going to end this thing on a high note before going into three off days. And when we come back on lockdown Red Wings segment three, lockdown Red Wings podcast. Yeah. So do you want to talk about Perron's play in this game? Or do you want to talk about Dylan Larkin in this game? Because, um, they're both. I want to talk huge. about Larkin first, just because I think that that play highlights an entire team mentality tonight that we did not see last season very often or have not seen in the last several years. Um, Dylan Larkin made one of the most un- I-, I genuinely did not comprehend what I saw. That was, <laughs> and I, and like, it's game three of the regular season. So like implications wise, like obviously it's not going to go down as like some, you know, like all time, you know, unbelievable. Like, look, it's going to be on every highlight tape ever type of play just because again, like game three of the regular season, but that is legitimately one of the more impressive plays I've ever seen on NHL ice. That was, that was remarkable. Like that, that was like Tayshawn Prince uh, blocking Reggie Miller against the Pacers, like just came out of nowhere from behind and then just caused, you know, the poke check between the skates. Like that, that was, it was unbelievable. And it, it got us a point. Like we, we should be talking about a two goal loss right now. Like that should be the recap. Like, Oh, Red Wings finally lose, we, we lose by two goals. One of them's an empty netter. That should be the recap right now, but no, we stole a point. And it's because in large part, due to an unbelievable play by Larkin. But uh, I think that the entire team, I thought, fought really hard. And yeah. you started seeing it. I saw, like, the f- the flip. That's not right. The switch kind of get flipped. Like, the at, the end- switched. <laughs> at the end of the first period, I, I think when they went down 2-1, to one, that's when they-, they went over to the bench where, like, we need to, like, pedal to the metal. And then I, I thought from then on out, again – there's at one point, like early in the third period, where I think where I thought it got a little dump and chasey for my liking, but I, I really thought that the whole team turned it up a notch. Perron will obviously get to had an unbelievable game. I thought they fought and they Tooth stole a nail. point from a playoff team, and I, I yeah, I, I was unbelievably impressed. Obviously with the Larkin play, but the team as a whole, I thought showed fight that we have not seen from a Red Wings team in a little bit. I mean, Dylan Larkin said, pay me. That's what that was. <laughs> I, the fact that he was able to do all that without drawing a penalty, he stuck his stick Unreal. between the guy's legs when he was just like, oh, it's easy. Like other players would have just taken the foot off the gas because they would have realized that the game was now over. He said in a last dish effort, I'm going to bust my ass back and make an attempt to save this goal. And he did without drawing a penalty. The Red Wings got possession off of that play and subsequently went down all the way on the other end of the ice and scored to tie the game up. So like you said, because of Dylan Larkin, solely because of that play by Dylan Larkin, the Red Wings walked away with a point against a playoff contender, the first playoff contender that they faced all season, where in a lot of points in this game, they were probably outmatched, especially yep. in their own zone. They walked away the point because of that heart, because of that battle, not just by Dylan Lark, what Dylan Larkin showed, but what the team as a whole showed. They fought tooth and nail. They fought absolutely tooth and nail in this game. And the it was also would not have happened without guys. Well, before I talk about David Perron, I also want to say Ken Cow called it on Friday's episode as well. He said that really the difference in these games is if you want to be a playoff contender, when you lose games, you have to lose them. And I'm paraphrasing. I can't remember the exact quote, but he said you have to lose games in overtime because those extra points that you get accumulate. And losing close matches in overtime just to get that loser point makes a huge difference. And losing to good teams where you fight tooth and nail, like, yeah, there's no such thing as moral victories, and I understand that. This isn't moral. We got a point we shouldn't have had. That's a physical point. That's a real, like, (laughs) that's not nothing moral about it. That's objectively, like, that that is something we should not have had that we got. This team already has 100% more heart than they did last year. And David Perron was a big part of that in this game. Yeah. Obviously he had so, so much he did in this game. Obviously he had two goals in this game, one of which was a power play goal, the Red Wings' first power play goal in the season. Finally, goodness. Finally. He also had the assist on the game tying goal as he was on the wing, passed it down low to Sunquist, who then just tucked it around Jonathan Quick 
for the game time goal of 40 seconds left. Again, thanks to Dylan Larkin on the other end, making that great defensive play. So David Perron and Dylan Larkin linked up, and this was after the line blender, mind you. This did not kick in until, and I hate the line blender, but I understand it in this game because you lost two of your wingers on the top six. You were trying to figure out what would work. Not that Kubalik looked bad, by the way. He mishandled the puck a few times, but he was in. He gave him, put himself in position to succeed. He just was fumbling the puck for some reason, but he was always in position. And I thought he had good chemistry with that line. But as yeah, soon as they I mean, put yeah, Perron, good recovery on the, on yeah. the assist for the, for well, the yeah, one goal, had, obviously. But yeah, I, he in the first half of the game, especially not his sharpest game, and and really was a a pretty sizable reason for a lot of the turnovers we talked about earlier. But um, he had a lot of really good chances as well, sitting right there. He just could not. He should have had a goal. I mean, yeah, he, he yeah. was just off. He was just off, like target. But like he he had like half the net open and just missed. But like was in the right position and. And yeah, I got a slapper off there. Yeah, but like you said, after the initial fumble, he recovered and got that puck across to Perron, yeah. who was playing with Dylan Larkin. And Dylan Larkin and Perron had some instant chemistry mm -hmm. because Perron then scored again to tie the game on the power play for the Red Wings' first power play goal. And then again, like I said, he had the assist on Sundquist's goal as well. And so I, I just David Perron was so huge in this game. Two goals, one assist. Now he's got, I think, like five points in three games. Um, just four points in three games, rather. But, I mean, he, Sunquist, and Olimata, and Dylan Larkin, wow, go figure, are the team lead in points, all at four points in three games. I mean, the guys who played the best in this game and have been looking like the best, well, Div Pron not necessarily wasn't, like, really all too impactful in the first game. But in this game especially, those four players shine, and those four players are at the top of the point charts for the Detroit Red Wings after three games because they all looked absolutely stellar. And I mean, I just, David Perron has been worth the price of admission at since, since day one, man, he's been yeah. great. Yeah, no, he's been great. I think somebody that, that hasn't gotten a lot of points yet this season necessarily, but I, I thought in this game really helped defensively when there's value was a, shined was a, a lot of help needed defensively because it was not a very good performance, but I thought Andrew Kopp played, played really well defensively, had a lot of pokes. Had a lot of pokes in the neutral zone, a lot in the defensive zone. I, I thought he looked really solid defensively. And yeah, I, I do want to talk about the line blender thing because that was uh, that's like a huge storyline in this game. I feel like I, I think um, that that th I mean it was a very apparent. It was all game, right? Like they were just mixing and matching lines, and it was it was kind of crazy at, at times, to be honest. Um, but I, I think that it's it was one of the biggest storylines of the game. I mean, at one point, there was a a, a Raymond Cop Soderblom line. Like I mean, like yeah. it, like he was just throwing stuff out there, seeing if something would stick. And you know, by the end of the third period, he found a couple that worked. I do want to talk about Elmer Soderblom as well. I think yeah. he looked fantastic. Um, I, I think <sighs> that he he still got he has the potential and like has the tools to be so valuable as a defensive forward as well, just because of the insane reach. We saw a couple of pokes in this one, but like there's still some, some spacing and, um, you know, gap no, control yeah. that I think he can work on, but you but know, he looks like, like a bona fide NHL. Player. Yeah. He's his third NHL game. He looks phenomenal. And the one play right where he drew the penalty, that's insanity. Like that, that was, he's not a real person. Like he's a unicorn that, that should not have happened. That was Un, an unbelievable play, an unbelievable way to draw a penalty, just flicking the puck up in the air and and, and messing with it. I don't know. Like, he he looked really good, though. He had a couple of really nice scoring opportunities as well. His zone entry, I think I've been really impressed with for how big he is. I don't think it – I don't know. That was, like, one of the things that I didn't think was necessarily a slam dunk, that he'd just be able to, to have, like, really great zone entry. But I thought, again, maybe more so maybe in the first period than the entire game, but – he showed signs of, of having some really good zone entry and getting being able to um, get all the way to the net with the puck on his stick. I don't know. I, I, I think that he has looked he has looked really, really good so far, obviously in his first three games, but tonight was just another example, yeah. I mean, and of course, we, I again, 100% agree with everything you said about Elmer. Um, I think another thing we have to point out, and we kind of, we touched on penalty kill, but we didn't outright say it, is that, they're they have not allowed a goal on penalty kill yet. Yeah, this team so was far. the worst penalty kill in the league last season. 
and they have not allowed a goal in the penalty kill so far. And they so, have one well, power play goal. So, and they have one power play goal, which, but again, the power play there. looked a, like a, obviously you have to score goals, and that's at the end of the day what matters. But when they had power plays, again, when they established zone pressure, they're creative. They just kept fanning on it, or they kept not getting everything on it. And they, but yeah, you, you can't spend 50 seconds trying to get into the zone though. Like, yeah. yes, I agree with you. When they were in the zone, they, they had opportunities and, and, uh, they, they had some really good looks and should have scored more than they did. I agree with you, but like, but they, you can they also, really... you know, took almost half the power play to even get in and establish themselves in the zone. But if, if I'm being honest, the thing that looked the most dangerous about that power play was Kubalik and Perron because yeah, they have absolute great. rockets of one timers. You get yeah. that puck to their stick. They're going to give you the best scoring chance you've had on the power play. And obviously, Perron had the uh, go figure. Perron had two one time goals in this. I'm right. sorry. He had one one time goal and a power play goal that was a snipe. And I mean, that's just what you brought him in to do. And I don't mean to go back to Perron because I, I, but I just, when it comes to the power play, they only had one power play goal in this game, one power play goal all season so far. But I think the power play has looked a lot better from last season. And I think the goals are going to come. I think that they've just been missing on their opportunities. So while they got outplayed by LA, I would say in this game, they also had a ton of opportunities to really kind of like in the devil's game where that they capitalized on those opportunities. They just failed to do so against the Kings in this one. They just could not get their stick on that puck when the puck was coming at them. They had a lot of opportunities to really surprise Jonathan quick in this game. They just couldn't get to. Yeah, um, and, and like, I know we got to wrap up here, but like, I, I think that, um, that that's been something that's been a th theme throughout all three of the first yeah. three games. And like, so that, that could be something that going forward, we have to keep an eye on this team is, is undoubtedly better than last year's team. You can already tell, you can already see it. We already knew that that was going to be the case offensively though. Let the difference so far, the alarming difference between last year's offense and this year's offense is way more opportunities Way more opportunities. Opportunities. So far this season. Yeah. Right, which is great. It's now the next step, right? Like when you're talking about step of, of improving as a team and like d developmentally, like what the steps are to continue growing and, and continue moving forward as an organization, the next step, you took one, great. You're getting more opportunities that you weren't making last year. That's a great step to take. The next one is then actually capitalizing on all the opportunities that you do give it yourself. And, uh, you know, we had one game where we got outshot by quite a lot and still won. And, like, so that that one is, you know, you, you took advantage of the opportunities given to you there, but that was pretty bad goaltending. And against the two good goaltenders they faced or two good performances from goaltenders they faced, um, you know, ha have been a lot of opportunities and uh, and not able to capitalize on a ton. You know, haven't. Haven't had a really poor offensive performance yet. Cross our fingers. You know, we're, we're still putting up good goal yeah. totals. Um, Three but, goals, five goals, four goals. I mean, yeah. that's just way better than last season. Already. Phenomenal. Granted, right? Two like, were empty netters against uh, still, Montreal. Like, but. Clear, clear improvement, though. Like, clear improvement. I'm not trying to be like a Debbie Downer. I'm just saying, like, there, there is – it could be more even, which is a great sign. Like, the, the fact that it that that's true is – is awesome, but like it could. And, and that's, I think the next step is capitalizing on more of those opportunities. But another thing, and this will be the last the thing I end on, but another thing that we've been talking about, but have not outright said is that none of this would be possible without the new additions. We've been talking about Peron. We've been talking about Sherat. We've been talking about Olimata. None of this teams, this, this game would not have happened without the players that Steve Eisenman brought in. Yeah. And it, that is a huge pro. That is a huge thing to look at, that the guys that you brought in are having an immediate impact on the offensive side of the puck and the defensive side of the puck. You look at the top 10 scorers on this team through three games. And granted, again, three games, so there's not a lot of points to go around. I mean, point total, the top point total is on your team is four right now. But of the top 10, six of them were not on this team at the start of last season. So you have number one is David Perron. Number two is Oscar Sunquist, who you acquired at the trade deadline last season. Number three is Oli Mata. Five is Kuba League. And then at number eight, you have Andrew Kopp. And at number 10, you have Bench Rot. So six of your 10 are guys that were not on the roster at the start of last season. And that, that, is, that is massive for yep. the team's development. So while there's a lot of glaring things that this team still needs to do to like win these hockey games, the fact that they got away with a point, have five points on the season, and are 2-0-1 to start the season – 
shows just how much, how many pros there are that this team has so far and how much of an improvement already that this team is. If you would have, if, if me from the future would have shown up and been a guest on this show the day before opening night and been like, Hey, after LA, you're going to head into Chicago on Friday, two Oh and one. We'd have been like, sign me up. What are we talking about? <laughs> like, heck yeah, dude. Like that's, you know what I mean? That that's the, absolutely. And, and that, that point that you made about, you know, a lot of our leading uh, producers being new acquisitions is just, we talk about it all the time, like raising the bar of what you demand out of the organization. Like, you don't want to get in the cycle of like uh, that a lot of the the Tigers organization has done where it's just like, Hey, we are only going to look at our own guys. And and we think that uh, Matt Shepard went on a huge tangent. He was like, okay, players are good and good players you think are great. And it's just like, that's what happens when you're bad for so long. This is what happens when you don't do that. And you bring in outside talent that raises the bar and raises the expectations and raises what, everybody demands out of this team production wise. And it's awesome to see. Yeah, absolutely. And so now the Red Wings are going to go to the United center, United center to play the Chicago Blackhawks on Friday. So they get three much needed days off to play a team that's bottom. going to probably be around the bottom of the standings. If not like third to worse, good teams, three days of rest going against a terrible team. Good teams win this game. They don't win these games. They dominate these games. Yeah, that's what I'm expecting out of the Red Wings. They have to dominate this game. If they want to prove that, Hey, we can't, we don't just beat bad teams. We just completely thrash them because that's what good teams do. So we'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day.